programmer at Boku. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter at Boaz Sender. I'm on Freenode a lot. Uh, ra raise your hand if you use IRC in the room. So I see a couple of hands. All of y'all should be on IRC. It's a great place. The WordPress channel is a great place to go and talk about WordPress. Also, if you're using jQuery or HTML5 uh, or you know any other technologies that uh, you care about, there's great rooms, uh, chat rooms on irc.freenode.net. Uh, so I recommend you uh, register a Nick on there and get uh, get crack. There's great, great, uh, very talented engineers and designers, mostly engineers, uh, there to support you uh, with the technologies. Uh, and lastly, uh, you can find me on the World Wide Web at boazender.com. So uh, I'm going to be talking to you about some cool new stuff that you can do with uh, CSS3 in your WordPress themes. Um, what is CSS3? Uh, so I'm going to be talking about some things that actually were in CSS before CSS3, like in CSS2. Um, CSS3, I'm just going to use it in this talk as a sort of loose description of new cool stuff that is now supported that you can use in modern browsers and uh, some older browsers. Uh, I'll also say that CSS3, for the purpose of this talk, is part of HTML5, uh, the brand that we have for uh, our open web platform. Uh, so what do you care about? Uh, we're going to be talking about these really exciting things, uh, practical things that you can use today, uh, and I'm going to walk you through how to use them. Uh, if I move too slowly, uh, you know, raise your hand and ask me some more complicated questions. If I move too quickly, raise your hand and ask me to explain. I, I'm happy to take questions. So uh, getting right into it, we've got some pretty exciting things uh, coming in selectors. Raise your hand if you know what a selector is. Awesome. Great. So we've got the anatomy of a, 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 a style rule uh, down. So we can do some, some pretty cool new stuff with pseudo selectors and input selectors. Um, do these kind of selectors look familiar to you all? Can by a show of hands? Half of you. So uh, the, you, there's a great resource on the W3C. Now, I find the W3C to not be a good resource for, for learning how to use these technologies generally, right? The W3C's website has specifications for browser implementers and not designers, uh, not users of the technology. So I pretty much avoid it. But in this case, this is a, uh, oh, right, and all my slides are going to be up here later if you want to copy down uh, gully slash KL uh, so you can get these links uh, later and I'll, I'll post it to Twitter. And I'm sure it'll be on the WordPress website. Hey, how's it going? It's gu dot g u l dot l y slash k l, as in kernel language. Uh, so the W. I don't know if we really have internet here that well. Um, Okay, so I'm not going to try and go there, but there's a great table of the selectors, in this case, uh, in the W3C spec, uh, in, the, in the CSS level 3 specification. Also, uh, can, by a show of hands, who here uses jQuery? Yeah, I think all of you use jQuery. It's in WordPress. Uh, jQuery selectors reference is pretty good. jQuery's sizzle selector engine uh, implements a lot of the new CSS3 uh, selectors uh, and some more stuff. Uh, but uh, if you've used some of the sort of amazingly expressive selectors in, in the jQuery uh, JavaScript library or in the jQuery function, uh, then you're f already familiar with a lot of this stuff. But essentially uh, what this is letting us do, uh, just how in the last talk Sarah showed us how to be specific about uh, the resolution of the browser with media queries and apply rules based on that, this lets you conditionally apply rules based on more complex uh, selectors. So you can say I want all of the anchor tags that do not have this class name. And uh, apply rules to those. I want all of the inputs uh, that have a class that contains wrapper, right? Uh, if, this, if this wasn't here, then it would be exactly equals wrapper, or if that was an exclamation point, uh, it would n not contain wrapper. Uh, and lastly, these are just a few examples, but um, we can also uh, select the disabled um, disabled inputs uh, in our pages. And these are, uh, these are all, well, this, uh, this is an example of a pseudo selector similar to hover. Um, so there's some, that's the vocabulary that we use for that. Uh, background size. 
Uh, background size is pretty cool because it allows you to resize background images. This is something that we've been wanting to do forever instead of having to, you know, save the image again. Uh, this is supported uh, in modern browsers, right? So this is supported, I think IE9 has this, uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and select uh, the section that I'm in and grab this image that I'm hosting locally. Uh, I guess I'm going to apply this to all sections. Uh, go ahead and get the background property. And that image should show up. Maybe it needs to be, have a height. So I should have a background image right now on this section. Maybe I want to try it on the div. You have a double semicolon. Sorry? Have a double semicolon. Oh, do I have a double semicolon? Where did that go? Wherever I put that style rule, right? So it was on a different element. And let me find it. It should be really long. And probably it just didn't get applied because I had a double semi semi semicolon. So I'm going to get the background again. There we go. That's exciting, right? So that's, but it's also huge, which is a problem. So we're going to go ahead and set the uh, background size to resize it. If I can find that rule again, there it is. Background size, I'm going to say 50%. And now it's repeating, which we didn't really want it to do, so maybe we'd go back up and select it, or say no repeat. And then go back down here and make it smaller. So that's pretty cool, right? That can streamline our workflow because we can use Firebug um, to, or Chrome developer tools to sort of, uh, you know, ad hoc resize our background images and get them to the right. Uh, you know, I could also, instead of doing a percentage here, I could do 30 pixels. Um, and this, this uses the same uh, syntax, so it's going to be, uh, I think, width and then height. Uh, so let's say I have the width be 30 pixels and 10 pixel height. I would then distort it dramatically, maybe 110. Uh, and so I can, I can actually know what, the width of my, what I want the width of my image to be and then go back into my image editor of choice uh, and update it. So now that background image is going to stay with us. Uh, raise your hand if you've used font face. Great. So this is really awesome. We can apply custom fonts that we host ourselves. Uh, this is the bulletproof font face syntax that was, uh, I guess, discovered by uh, Paul Irish. Uh, he's got a good post uh, that I neglected to link to. Oh, no, I linked to it here uh, on his blog back in 2009. Uh, you can see I'm using a custom font here that I can highlight. It's great. I can use font face all the way back to older versions of Internet Explorer, uh, and that's really exciting. Uh, some great resources if you haven't, uh, if you're not familiar with them, that are hosting lots of open web fonts for you to use are Google Web Fonts, Font Squirrel. Uh, those are two really nice ones. They overlap a little bit. There's also like the League of Type, Open Type, or something. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. Um, but so uh, I encourage you to use that. Text Shadow is pretty leet. Uh, raise your hand if you use Text Shadow before. Awesome. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But essentially, I can uh, inspect this element. Uh, grab the section heading level two uh, and update its text shadow to be like 10 pixels, 10 pixels red. And I need to give it also a blur radius. I need one more zero in order for that to work. Right, and that's really cool. Uh, and the other cool thing is you can add more of these. So I could then add like 10 pixels, th 2 pixels, 3 pixels, uh, you know, green. Right? And we can do all sorts of crazy stuff. There's a great website. It's another Paul Irish classic called, I'm not going to be able to visit it, mother effing tech shadow. Uh, dot com, where you, it gives you a really cool tool for giving like those awesome sort of like, like early 90s style Technicolor like video game graphic drop shadow launching into the future. Um, 
So that's going to be annoying. I'm going to refresh this. Uh, insets. Insets are pretty cool. Or sorry, uh, box shadows. Box shadows are pretty cool. They're just like text shadows, except instead of applying them to text. Oh, right. And I should mention um, that sort of really trendy stamped out text effect, embossed text effect that we're seeing everywhere. Uh, you can achieve that with text shadow. Um, you know, uh, by having a uh, lighter colored text shadow than your text on a darker background. Uh, it will look like it's stamped out and it will, you know, feel very 2010. Um, maybe, maybe we've got another year in that one. Uh, box shadow. Box shadow is the same thing except it applies to boxes and it's got this cool other rule called inset. So that's neat. Uh, I'm going to style this section. Uh, well, first I'm going to go ahead and style this div. I'm going to go ahead and style this, my syntax uh, highlighter uh, with a, um, I don't think we need, actually, we don't need the vendor prefixes anymore. So you don't need to specify WebKit or Mozilla. I can just say box. Yeah, it's in there. Box shadow. Let me say uh, one pixel, one pixel, uh, 10 pixels, uh, black. Right? And I styled the wrong thing. I styled that div. So that's okay, though, because you can see it on the edges there, right? So then this other cool thing I can do to make it seem like it's stamped out is I can say inset and the shadow will be applied into the box instead of out of it. And then I can go ahead and do like border radius, you know, three pixels and make it seem like really super like, I don't know, like I've got this cool dish or something. Uh, so that's a nice effect um, that we can do. Uh, and uh, if we had the internet, you can go to iHeart inset and I'm going to try it. Uh, it's not going to work. I'm, I'm going to try and let that load because it's pretty cool. Uh, one, of the other, one of the things, no, I'll try and let it load. Um, so uh, I'm going to refresh this because we don't want to keep seeing that. Transforms, gradients, oh my. Uh, so gradients are pretty cool. Actually, so this whole presentation is an HTML5 slideshow. I don't know if you've noticed. I'm using uh, new semantic elements. I'm using CSS3 transitions and uh, JavaScript to detect the keys and move things along. Uh, the background is a CSS3 gradient. Um, so uh, the gradients that I'm using are, I believe those are the gradients I'm using. Uh, it's kind of, uh, there's kind of this tough syntax for doing it uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the, the sort of verbose syntax for, for doing these gradients. Uh, you can, instead of using the URL, uh, parameter uh, uh, value for the background image property, you can use the radial and linear gradient uh, proper uh, values. Um, and so you can use, go ahead and say mod linear gradient and then uh, uh, specify uh, your first circle, uh, what the gradient, what the form of the gradient is going to be. I think this could also be oval. Uh, your second circle and then the transition between, I don't even really know this syntax because I never use it. Uh, but you can look that up uh, with Google. There's a terser syntax for uh, Mozilla that I use. Um, and actually, really, I don't use any of these. I use css3please.com, uh, which I'll get to later in my slides. Uh, but this terser syntax uh, just lets us say whether we want a radial or a linear gradient. Um, so moz radial gradient, I pass in the first value and the second value, and it will uh, expand from the first to the second. Uh, so this is using a radial gradient in the background. By the way, if you're following along with these slides, I should also note that I've only made them for uh, Mozilla Firefox. It's because I started with uh, somebody else's slideshow that only worked in Firefox. Uh, typically for development, I use Chrome, uh, but that's an aside. Uh, so we've got this, uh, this, this um, terser syntax, which is really nice, and we can use that. Uh, there's, I also did a blog post about how to, this isn't going to, oh, was that something? Yeah, okay. This is. Is this hard to do? Yeah. Reboot. Yeah. Wow. It's a fail. <laughs> uh, but other than that, great job to the conference organizers. This is a phenomenally <laughs> well put together conference. Let's have a round of applause for the WordCamp Boston <laughs> conference organizers. I was really impressed with the schedule in my badge. I thought that that was very uh, clever. Uh, and also, it just seems really well organized. But yeah, so uh, I've done a nice blog post here that you can get from the slides. Um, on the Boku web blog about how to uh, use these WebKit radial gradients because they get kind of complicated. Uh, transforms. Transforms are pretty neat. We can use them to do things like rotate elements in the page. I'm going to go ahead and do that for you right now. Um, 
So I'm going to grab this syntax highlighted element, and I'm going to say Moz transform rotate 20 degrees, and that's pretty neat. Uh, I could then, you know, rotate my element as I want with the same up and down uh, arrows that I use. I guess I can't. I could rotate it like that and find out the rotation I like uh, and then apply that. Uh, this could also be, you know, you could also uh, then go ahead, you can use, and you can, by the way, you can use transforms uh, for a lot of different things. I encourage you to look at the Mozilla Developer Center. I think they renamed it to the MDN, Mozilla, Mozilla Developer Network. Um, link that I've provided here because you can use transforms to do a lot of things. Uh, uh, and you can even use, you can use matrices uh, and you can write matrix transforms to uh, transform your elements based on, based on a matrix, which is useful because uh, there, uh, there's another type of, uh, there, was, there were, f I think actually using IE filters back in IE5, you could use uh, matrix transformations in there. So you could have the same matrix apply to every browser in existence and that can be useful if you want to figure out how to do that. Um, and I should also mention, actually, uh, that <laughs> these are all using the same sort of uh, idioms that we're used to for CSS. So uh, top offset, I think top offset, left offset, and then this is blur radius. Um, there was another example, same with text shadow. Um, uh, and so we'll find that, <clears throat> you know, these new exciting things that we can do with CSS3 um, use the, use the sort of the same idioms. Uh, transitions are really cool. Um, transitions, uh, uh, transitions, so we have in CSS3 or in the new CSS stuff that we can do, we have, uh, we have transitions and we have animations. I'm going to get to animations in a minute. Uh, what transitions let us do is talk about how we want to transition, uh, one element, uh, uh one element's properties, uh, from, a from uh, one style rule to another. So I can say I want all sections to, um, I, I could say that in a, in a hover state, I want uh, this element to turn red. Uh, and, then I, and then when I hover on it, it will turn red, right? Uh, but then I can also say that I want its transition, um, uh, its, you know, Ma's transition to be, well, this is now, I'm showing you the very verbose syntax, but I can also do, I'm gonna refresh this just so we can read. Um, you know, I can also uh, say something to the effect of, I'm going to grab this div. Uh, I can also say something to the effect of, um, you know, Moz transition. I could just say I want all the properties to get transitioned and I want it to take one second to transition them. Uh, now, I didn't uh, have the foresight to set up another uh, a hover state for all of these things, um, but, um, you, well, maybe I'll just go ahead and do that. I have my presentation open here. Transition. So I'm going to just add a style block. I'm going to say, all, uh, well, I, I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab P, I'm going to grab subhead and, well, I'm going to, I'm going to grab subhead. I'm going to grab all P's. When I hover, I'm going to say color. I don't know if this is going to cascade over my other rules. Um, I might have more ex uh, explicit color rules for paragraphs, but say I want it to be uh, green. And then I'm just going to also say, go ahead and say, uh, for P's, I'm going to say Moz transition, make sure I spelled that right, all, uh, you know, 1S. I could also say like 0.5S. And then my slide disappears. <laughs> so you can see that that thing turned green. Does everyone see that? Well, hey, hold on, hold on, you're laughing, but right? I mean, that's, 
What's going on here is actually uh, I've, we've got some JavaScript code that's doing something special to these and wrapping them in something more specific. So I could say p comma let's do p comma p a and then p that's I want to do that. I want to get all a's that are inside of p's. Um, and then I'm going to go also uh, P A, well, what the heck? A hover. I also broke something here where when I refresh the page, the slides go away. But you know, that's because this is the, this is a Saturday. I don't know what that is. There we go. So that's pretty nice, right? We got that nice effect. Which is, which, is, which is like a nice thing and, and we can just add this in for fun. We can just add the transition rules in for fun on our existing uh, anchor links uh, and we can just call it a progressive enhancement for modern browsers that support this stuff uh, because our clients don't really, weren't expecting it, right? So it's, it's, nice, it's a nice thing for us to do. Um, so you can just add that in and, and you'll have this nice like, extra fidelity in the hover state, um, uh, which is nice. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete this because who knows what else what other trouble that could cause. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean generally, right, this idea of progressive enhancement uh, is kind of the approach that we want to be taking, uh, I think, today, uh, especially when we talk about like responsive design, like Sarah did such a good job doing uh, in the last presentation, right? Uh, I think somebody asked in her talk, does it make it harder? I'd say yeah, it makes it maybe like, for me at least, 20% harder adding these little progressive uh, enhancements to be responsive. Uh, I, I guess the question, it doesn't make it harder, depends on how much time you have um, or how much how how specific you want to get right but if you just want to add these little progressive enhancements actually maybe it makes some things easier right because you have a like a conceptual framework to use with your client for hey like different experiences and different devices and different browsers uh, which is which makes sense right like you don't want like buttons don't look the same in Firefox and Internet Explorer they just look different right there's different browser Chrome your users are used to seeing different stuff so um, if they have a modern browser uh, maybe they're used to seeing nice transitions in the links, uh, but if they have an older browser, they're used to the internet looking like shit. And so <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Animations. Animations are different than transitions. Animations let you set up actual keyframe animations. Uh, and that's pretty neat. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and actually have had the foresight to put uh, the Moz keyframes uh, change color uh, rule uh, declaration in my code. Now notice I'm using the at symbol here. This is an at rule. Uh, and if the at font face is sort of like was elusive to anyone, right? Like let's just go back and look at that. Uh, at rules behave a certain way in, uh, in CSS. So at font face, uh, we have an at rule here. And what that's doing is when I use the at symbol, I'm declaring something to be used later, right? I'm declaring a new font family. At rules get used for declaring stuff. Same with animations. And when I make an animation, whoa, excuse me. We're almost at the end. Uh, when I make an animation, I declare it first. I de I'm declaring this new change colors animation. And I've already put that in my CSS for this presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and add the Moz animation. Uh, I'm going to add the Moz animation property to the target element, uh, which right now I think is the container of, uh, uh, that we're looking at. Yeah, I've put a target element. Um, class on the section uh, that we're looking at uh, and let's see if I can find it. I don't know if I styled it or not. Yeah, there it is. So I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, Moz animation animation uh, should be change colors and that I want this to run on a 10 sec, well, I want this to take 10 seconds to complete. I want to run on an infinite infinite loop. And I'm going to go ahead and say I want it to take one second to complete just so we can see this. So I can actually structure real animations that uh, keyframe animations in my CSS and this is really neat. Uh, this, I mean this isn't really neat but the concept <laughs> is really neat. So uh, if you can see my animation, if you can follow along with it, uh, I'm starting at 0% with a color of gray and a top position of 100, and I'm uh, 
infinitely looping. Now I could I could go I could probably I don't know actually uh, if this would work right, but I could also go in here and say uh, you know at fifty percent change this to fifty percent and then at a hundred percent. Well, uh, the point I'm trying to make, and this isn't a good way of making it, uh, is that uh, we can add, we can have lots of steps in here. So we can have, you, know, you, can, add, it's a, you can be as high resolution as you want to be uh, with your keyframe animations. And you can add in uh, steps at different points. You, I, I could add in a third color. I could do a lot of, I could change a lot of things. And notice I was explicit uh, with what I was targeting. So my other, my other, um, my other sections aren't jumping up and down. I think that would be funny though, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, Prezo section, just grab this one, uh, Moz animation, see it's not even in the autocomplete yet, uh, color, or change, change colors, what did I have to do, uh, one second, infinite, What's causing the bouncing? The, what's causing the bouncing is the animation, uh, if you, you can see here. <laughs> I'm causing the bouncing. <laughs> right, no, sorry. Uh, so uh, uh, what I'm saying here, I've got to stop the bouncing. Wait, so what's happening is uh, at 0%, we're saying, I want this to be at 100%, at, at the first frame of the animation. And, right, uh, and then when I, uh, so I'm, I'm, def I'm declaring a new animation that goes from, 100 pixels pushed down and gray to no pixels pushed down and badass, right? B-A-D-A-5-5, five five. Uh, the famous Evan Roth color, if you're not familiar. And then we're going ahead and we're, get, we're applying it, this Moz animation. Now, it, it added a bunch of gobbledygook like it does, but uh, I just said I want this animation to be change. Can you see this down here? Change colors. And I want it to take one second. Right, I could say I wanted to take 10 seconds and it would go slower. Uh, I could say I wanted to take 0.1 seconds, which so would be more fun. And then I wanted to loop infinitely, right? Um, infinite. <laughs> I'm scared. So you guys are all going to have Caesars. <laughs> I, I guarantee one of, somebody in this room is going to have a client ask them to do this. I want a pop-up window to come out of it. <laughs> this is a WordPress conference. So, uh, right, and then there's some other stuff you can do, like I can say linear, and that is the easing function that should be applied uh, to this animation when it is applied to the element. Raise your hand if you know what an easing function is. Awesome. Uh, so you can, there's ease and out, bounce, there's a bunch of them that you can do. You can even write your own, I believe, and also, I think, I showed the, uh, an example of that in the transitions, right? In the transitions, you can just say, like, I can, I can apply the, the, the terse syntax of the transition, which is all I ever do, because I never get this specific. But um, I can also be explicit with the timing function to be used, and I can use a cubic Bayesian uh, uh, value there and pass in the function that I want to be used um, to, de to define the vector representation of the easing function that I want to use. Um, uh, if I don't be, if I'm not explicit about that, I think you can just say linear. I think it, I think the browser will just say linear. Of course, I'm sure maybe different browsers do different things. Uh, I also pre-opened up before I came here today uh, a CSS animation that I did uh, some time back. That's my email. Uh, so this is a CSS3 animation that I did uh, using the same kind of code. Uh, and I've even added some cool transitions in here so that when I hover over the HTML5 icons, they uh, respond by translating it to a Z, uh, a Z axis of zero. Right? Uh, this is also using uh, th 3D stuff, which is only supported in Safari and Chrome at this time. Yes? Thank you. Uh, excellent presentation so far. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you. Does your page loading change? Does it affect it significantly other than the delays that you specifically put in there? Does like, the page you know, load change the time it takes for the page to load? Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, if I was trying to do this with JavaScript, yeah, like I'd need to load in a bunch more stuff probably. Other than, I mean, I'm just loading in CSS. So I'm going to show you the source of this page. 
right? It's a spinning HTML5 logo demo by at Boa Sender. I've got a keyframes animation up here doing the same kind of stuff, except I'm doing it uh, with a uh, y rotation. Uh, I'm changing the y, uh, the y axis of my, my animation or my entities. Then I'm doing some, a bunch of stuff that we're not going to talk about here uh, to do the 3D stuff that I just copied from somebody else's blog. Uh, same thing here. Uh, here you can see to the container element I'm applying the spin animation at 10 seconds infinite linear. Uh, so it's looping. Uh, I did some stuff here with the images to make them uh, have a hover state. Uh, huh? Yes. Uh, so um, this is all online at uh, code.boku.com slash html5 logo dash 3D. Uh, so you can see then I've, wait, let me show you the HTML, right? All I have is this container class with images of classes A through I um, and then a statement about how this doesn't work very well on all browsers. Uh, and then I'm giving a starting uh, position to all of the images around the H. So let's open this up. Do I have this locally? HTML5 logo. No. Yeah, I should have this locally. Well, if we were to open this up in like Firefox or, uh, it, by, by the way, if you open this up on your uh, mobile phones, it's friggin' awesome. Uh, on, sorry, on your iPhones. <laughs> uh, doesn't work on Android. I could get it to work on Android today. When I did this demo back in, well, probably, I think like a couple, five months ago, it wasn't, I couldn't get it to work in anything besides Safari and Chrome. And, and you couldn't even get it to work in Chrome um, at that time. Anyway, so this is really cool for like iPad stuff, right? It's, it's actually really uh, performant and efficient. Uh, some of the stuff I'm talking about today affects page load in the sense that these rules are like processor intensive and graphics intensive to apply to the page and so they don't happen right away and so it may seem like it's a, a seem it may seem like it's affecting it may a seem like the uh, page load is affected because you've got this like sort of flash of unstyled content right that that's a big thing for at font face they call it the falc uh, and there's ways to avoid that right there's lots of uh, techniques and strategies for avoiding the falc in uh, in um, uh, with, with, with that font face, and I'm happy to talk more about that if people are interested. But, uh, you know, and, and also different browsers have different strategies built in to, uh, to avoid the falc, uh, including uh, like Safari will just hide your content until it's done styling it, whereas Firefox will show it in one state and then show it change. Um, anyway, I'm just going to go back. Uh, so other things, right, just really quick about this demo. Um, Right, uh, transitions are be behave differently on mobile devices. I've noticed. So if you load this up on your iPhone 4, which I encourage you to do, and you touch one of these things, they'll stick in the middle, which is kind of cool. It's an unexpected effect. I actually think it's cooler. Like when I first did this, and then I came into work, and I was using our iPad uh, to try it out. Like I thought that was I couldn't put the iPad down. I was just like walking around with it, touching these things. It was like a game. So you should check that out. Uh, and speaking of games, like this animation strategy is really useful for games. So if you're a game designer, uh, talk to, or a game developer, check out like Google like CSS3 sprite animations because you can do really cool sprite animations. Um, yes. Um, I don't know what percentage of the, the audience already knows the answer to this question, but some of us don't, so I'll ask it. Um, you have a lot of these things that start with dash mose or dash webkit. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is that? A, a ten second. Yeah, yeah, sure. So those are that. vendor and prefixes, right? Uh, we've got four browser, four dominant browser vendors: Opera, uh, Microsoft, Mozilla, and Google. And they prefix the new stuff that they're working on so that they're not polluting the global namespace. So they prefix the stuff that that are in flux uh, features because they're going to change probably, maybe. Um, and so you'll see like lots of people using all of the prefixes and then the non-prefixed version of it, right? So I might just go at keyframes uh, as well if I'm shipping production code to try and future-proof it. So, but in general, if you use one, do you have to think about using them all? Uh, it depends if you want your stuff to work in uh, other browsers, which usually is yes. I have one more slide, actually. Uh, CSS columns, these things are weird. I don't use them. 
I don't even know how well they're supported, but this guy, Robert O'Callaghan, has a blog post about it. So, uh, but they're kind of cool. Like, when they're, like, they're kind of cool. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and style all P's. So this is going to happen to all P's, but we only care about the ones we're looking at. I'm going to go and say, hey, Moz column count is two. Whoa, I've got two columns. I'm going to say the height is 200 pixels, and uh, I've got a two-column layout. So forget those fluid grids because uh, <laughs> this one's this one sounds it seems pretty cool, um, which is a bummer for me because I'm a Blueprint CSS contributor and like you know I have a whole bunch of like knowledge about stuff that I'm never going to use again because I've been doing this <laughs> for too long. Uh, Moz column gap. I'm going to go ahead and say this is my gutter if you're a Blueprint user. Um, you know, so yeah, I've got a multi-column layout. And I've broken everything. Good resources that I just want to point you to. I wish the internet worked. CSS3, please. It's a website that I worked on with a couple of friends uh, that auto-generates all these different things. Everything I've talked to you about here today is on CSS3please.com and it lets you like modify a test element. Uh, and get the values and copy them off. So use that. WestCiv is also really good for the transform stuff, the 3D transforms. WestCiv.com, that guy's awesome. And delicious.com slash bsender slash CSS3. Uh, I've linked to some stuff there. Um, that might be a, um, an older link that I don't keep up to date so much. Um, I think maybe I have like time for one question. More? What, what your technique is for loading shims and things like that? Shims. So getting stuff to work in older browsers, mocking this stuff. Uh, I, so get, like CSS shims are harder to do than JavaScript shims. And for those of you who are not familiar with a shim, uh, it's something that you can put in. Uh, t it's a, something, you can, something you can add to your page and include, uh, like a, a style sheet or a, um, a JavaScript a file that will uh, mock the functionality of what you're doing in older browsers and let you use the same interface for you know using the words. So there's a good shim for um, media queries called Respond.js that's by Scott Gell, uh, our very own Scott Gell from Boston, from the Filament Group. The guys were working on jQuery Mobile, uh, and he made Respond.js uh, for I think that might have been what Sarah had linked to. He made Respond.js for uh, shimming media queries. And what he does is he actually like parses the contents of your style sheet and applies them in jQuery, which is crazy. So I know the technique is possible. Uh, I've never done it. Um, but, uh, and I think you need to host your style sheet on the same domain in order for JavaScript to add it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, in job, I certainly, when I'm doing, H, like using HTML5 elements, like in this presentation, if I'm chipping to production, uh, there's a, like a, another example of a shim that you might use so that people are familiar with this concept is like there's an HTML5 shim out there because Internet Explorer has a problem styling elements that didn't come with it. So all these new elements in Internet Explorer 6, don't, you can't style them, or 7, I think, or maybe even 8. Um, and so what you need to do is there's a trick that someone figured out, which is use JavaScript to create the element off, like in memory in JavaScript magic uh, or in uh, off DOM uh, for those of you JavaScript programmers in the audience and then uh, uh, inject it into the DOM and then it will let you style it. So what it does is it just has a list of all the new elements, semantic elements that come with HTML5 and it does that and so that's a shim. Um, generally my approach is like a, you know, a, uh, a feature detection approach to uh, pr uh, progressive enhancement whereby we look and see what features are available and create one experience on one sort of localized area of the page based on that. And if the feature is not available, uh, then we just don't, then we, you know, we, we give as good of experience as we possibly can. Modernizer is a great library for, for detecting features in the browser. Uh, what it will do is it will, you include Modernizer as the JavaScript library. When your page loads, it will go and add classes to the, the body of your page or the HTML tag, the body of your page, saying what's supported and what's not supported. And you can write conditional CSS based on what's supported and what isn't, uh, which is really cool. Um, so I think that that's it.